सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली पाकिस्तान इज ए सब्जेक्ट वी कीप कमिंग बैक टू सॉर्ट ऑफ पेरियल कटर सब्जेक्ट I know that some of you complain that we have too much Pakistan, but at the same time, I know that a very vast number of you like it. There is a lot of curiosity about Pakistan and interest, as as it should be, because it's a very important neighbor. It also a neighbor with which we've always had a very dynamic relationship in the sense that it keeps changing. Unlike say with China, which goes into a deep slumber or freeze for long periods of time, sometimes for decades. Mercifully, and then it comes back to life, as is the situation now. But Pakistan is a dynamic situation. The reason we are talking about Pakistan today, however, is not because of something that's happened in Pakistan all of a sudden, or the usual stories: Pakistani politics, Pakistan's economic situation, or anything that might have happened on the LOC. In fact, LOC is quite quiet right now. The reason we are talking about is that we now have the benefit of a great insight. So this is a book which has just been published. It's a memoir of Satyendra Kumar Lamba or Sati Lamba, as we all called him. Sati Lamba was one of our finest diplomats. Unfortunately, died last year. This book, his memoir, has been released posthumously, and his wife Nina Lamba and friends they've all worked very hard at it. This is a wonderful new addition to our understanding of what's happened between India and Pakistan, say over the past. 30 years but this book in fact tells us a lot more than that look at the title of this book it says in pursuit of peace india pakistan relations under six prime ministers so six prime ministers if you read the book he's talking about mrs gandhi indira gandhi he was an IS, ifs officer of 1964 batch first came across mrs indira gandhi when she made a short stop over in moscow on her first visit overseas as prime minister she was a very new prime minister she was coming back from washington making a stop over in moscow moscow soviet union then was becoming a very important ally for india so he was then appointed her liaison officer for a couple of days so if you look at india's prime ministers that he served under the six prime ministers you would say indira gandhi rajiv chandrashekhar pv narasimha rao atal bihari vajpayee Manmohan Singh so six prime ministers each prime minister did something or the other with pakistan they had to deal with the pakistan question in many ways now this is a memoir and i am doing this this episode of cut the clutter in a very unusual way i am not doing any decluttering in fact he has done most of the decluttering so what i am doing doing is i'm taking out some key highlights which make us understand one some key junctures of our recent history in terms of what happened what might have happened how close we came to peace how the quest for peace with pakistan has been a common has been a common factor among all these six prime ministers but also the current prime minister narendra modi because one of the most important revelations if you want to call it that that mr lamba has made in this book is that in 2014 after mr modi came to power he became prime minister he called mr lamba for two meetings he reviewed the files of a near settlement that mr lamba as the prime minister special envoy in back channel talks with the pakistanis first with tariq aziz then with shahryar khan they had reached the stage of a draft agreement between the two countries right and that file mr modi had reviewed by then there were discussions he also reveals in this book that as late as in april in fact he puts a date on 20th of april 2017 he was approached by the prime minister's office obviously by our prime minister's office to ask if he'd be willing to go to pakistan on more back channel talks and he had agreed to do so and then something happened and then as as he mentions stories came out in pakistan to me to my sort of conspiratorial or twisted mind it looks like it was a deliberate leak by the powers that be in pakistan stories appeared that industrialist sajjan jindal the steel magnate in india he had gone to pakistan also as a kind of special envoy of the prime minister 
at which point Mr. Lama says, he said that, that you can't have two special envoys travelling to Pakistan on behalf of, of the Prime Minister. The Pakistan government, on the other hand, issued a statement. It was Nawaz Sharif's government that Sajjan Jindal had only come in in his capacity as a personal friend of Nawaz Sharif. After all, Nawaz Sharif's own business empire is mostly about steel and Sajjan Jindal also is a steel magnate. Nevertheless, that trip did not happen and then other things happened and this relationship went south. So as long as early or say in the second quarter of 2017, an effort was made by the Modi government to reach out and set up some kind of back channel talks. The book also tells us that at various points of time, in fact, the most fascinating thing about the book is it tells you that at almost no time have India and Pakistan not have back channel talks. So he mentions that even around time he was approached already, back channel talks were going on between our national security advisor Ajit Doval and the Pakistani national security advisor then Lieutenant General Nasir Khan Janjua and they met in Bangkok and places like that. Once again, if you want to figure out how authentic the book is, see. This book has an endorsement by Ajit Doval himself, who is the current National Security Advisor. And see what he's saying about the book. I will just read a couple of sentences for you from what he's saying by way of his endorsement for the book. And then I will show you something else. So Ajit Doval says in his endorsement, the book provides a ringside view of a seasoned diplomat who in his long career spent many years dealing with Pakistan and its inexplicable perfidy. Right? Uh, it provides a new perspective to many known and some not so well known events and circumstances that shaped the vexed Indo Pak relations. His authentic and objective narration will substantially contribute to a serious historical study of bilateral relations between the two countries and also provide a rare insight for common readers. Brilliantly articulated, the book contains gripping accounts of his personal interactions with many people who shape bilateral relations in both countries. The book also holds many lessons for future diplomats and policymakers who will have to deal with a difficult neighbor for a long time and will have a bearing on our national security. That is the current national security advisor. And he is now in his second term as national security advisor with the Modi government. And then see the foreword to the book. The foreword to the book is written by none else than Dr. Manmohan Singh. I can read a couple of lines from the foreword also. It says, this is an important book on an important subject. Shri K. S. K. Lamba is a distinguished diplomat with a deep understanding of Asian geopolitics, especially India-Pakistan relations. He comes from Peshawar as I do and his family had very close links with the Northwest Frontier Province. This personal connection is re reflected in his discussions of that region and in his commitment to peace and reconciliation between India and Pakistan. Now, he is very careful. Manmohan Singh is very careful not to reveal anything. But he says, he says, I believe the book will provide valuable insights to all those interested in understanding the past and future of the relations between India and Pakistan. The reason I've read this out in some detail is to convince you that this is a book or this is an account, the authenticity of which has been confirmed or endorsed by both sides. Now, the fact of this back channel talks, etc., how close the two sides came to a settlement in the Manmohan Singh era and the Manmohan Singh Musharraf era, that has been reported to some extent. What Mr. Lamba has done in this case, he's also listed the 14 guiding principles that Prime Minister of India had given him in his negotiations. Now, I'm not reading all the 14 guiding, uh, guiding principles. I'm just telling you the most important ones. And once again, I suspect these will at some point or the other keep coming back in our lives. So number one, no redrawing of borders. Borders will remain as they are. Number two, no shared sovereignty. Number three, line of control will become like a normal border. Number four, people on both sides of that line of control, that becomes a normal border. They will be allowed free movement on both sides. That means Kashmiri people can unite on both sides, visit each other's families, there will be easier travel, softer borders. Next point, there will be meaningful trade and then there will be end of hostilities, violence and terrorism. And the twin pillars of this understanding between the two countries, one, even for the talks to go on, one was for the ceasefire to hold. And second, that no country should allow its territory to be used by non-state actors or by, or by terrorist organizations. And there are many others. Now, the fact is that given how 
the situation has changed now or the how the situation on the ground has altered particularly after the constitutional changes in Kashmir status of 5th August 2019 a lot of this will not apply but the fact is that these are the principles on which the two sides worked. He also in his book has given us the details of the draft agreement that the two sides had reached. And once again, he tells us that he discussed with Dr. Manmohan Singh that, that before the new government comes in, there should be public disclosure of the talks that have been going on through back channels. So he was allowed or he was advised by Dr. Manmohan Singh to do so. And he did so at a university lecture that he gave in Srinagar. So all that is about the more recent period. But if you, if you go back and go deeper into the book, it tells you a great deal about some other interesting phases also. The Narsimha Rao phase, for example, the 1991 to 93 period for India in terms of internal security was one of India's toughest periods. That is when terrorism in Punjab had come back and it had come at a pace and at a rate and at a, at a kind of bloodiness that was not seen in Bhindra Wale's times. In fact, in, in one calendar year then, more than 15,000 people were killed in Punjab, of which about 10% were uniformed men, mostly of Punjab police. Now, it, it was in that period that Narsim Rao, he explains, also dealt with a very hostile America. And there are two things there which are quoted in some detail. One is Robin Rafel's famous or infamous statement that we all know about. So, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton or Clinton won in his first term speaking at the UN. In September 1993, he referred to Kashmir being, and I quote from the book, a trouble spot where bloody ethnic religious war rages. That got India very worried. And immediately around that time, there was that famous or infamous statement from Robin Rafel, who was then Assistant Secretary of State in the State Department, also was considered to be a close aide of Clinton and was specially appointed in the job. And she, she made a statement that further got India very worried. And her statement, again I'm quoting from the book, is, we view Kashmir as a disputed territory. And that means we do not recognize the instrument of accession as meaning that Kashmir is forevermore an integral part of India. So those were the things that Narsimha Rao dealt with. And then he explains how Narsimha Rao then resolved that situation. In fact, it was around that time, and I am adding that that's not in the book. In one of the interviews, Benazir then, because she was back as Prime Minister between 1993 and 1996, he made a statement in an interview to, I think, an Indian publication where she said it was still easier to deal with the Indian side when you had people of some class. I don't remember whether she said class or whether she said pedigree, but something like that, meaning that, like the Gandhi family. How do we deal with people of the kind that lead India now? And that had got Narsimha Rao very angry. And in fact, he had then said privately to people around him that he will make a horrible example of Benazir Bhutto. And that is when India really doubled up on the fight back in Punjab and in Kashmir. And Narsimha Rao then also doubled up on diplomacy, of which Lama was also a part. And then he explains how Narsimha Rao turned things around. In fact, it was later he went to Washington. He addressed the joint session of U.S. Congress and Senate and mood by that time had begun to change. Of course, it was helped along by the fact that the reforms that he started in 1991 had begun to show an impact and India's rising economic strength had also become a great asset for Narsimha Rao and he used it quite adroitly. Now, before Narsimha Rao, he also takes you back to the more fraught 1990-91 period. 1990 is the time when Pakistan actually held out a nuclear threat to India. Sahib Zada Yaqub Khan, then Foreign Minister of Pakistan, came to India, met I.K. Gujral, who was then India's Foreign Minister, and they went out for a half-hour walk in the gardens of South Block. Now, why do top diplomats or top leaders go out for a walk and talk then? Because they don't want to be bugged by anybody. It was during that walk that Yaqub Khan gave out a nuclear threat to I.K. Gujral, and that's recorded as, and I quote, this war won't be like any other, that India's mountains and rivers will be caught in an all-consuming fire of the kind never seen before. And on the very first day of the war, what that means is that Yaqub Khan threatened that, look, I know that I have a nuclear weapon. You are not sure that you have a nuclear weapon. This is only 1990. Also, he's telling uh, Gujral that you have a weak government, that's v VP Singh's government. So I will start the war by dropping the nuclear bomb first. To which I.K. Gujral then replied, 
He said, you should avoid talking recklessly because we've all been brought up on the same rivers as you. So I've heard this conversation from Mr. Gujral in Hindi and Punjabi as he spoke. He said, Yaqub sahab, aapko aise recklessly baat nahi karni chahiye kyunki humne bhi unhi daryaon ka pani piya hai jinka aap ne piya hai. Translated what this means is that if you can do extreme things, we will not be scared. We can also do equally extreme things in response. Now that is, that is a controversy that has raised on all this time. Seymour Harsh wrote about it. Other people have written about it. And now you see confirmation coming out in very well documented books and accounts. This is one of those. This book also exposes Benazir. Now somehow in India, as elsewhere in the world, also in Pakistan, there's been a feeling that the Bhuttos have been softer on India. This book tells us that the truth is exactly the opposite. The Bhuttos, if anything, have been much more hawkish on India. Also because when Bhuttos come to power, they have to justify to the army, to the establishment that they are not friendly to India, they are not soft on India. So while on the other hand, he tells us about a conversation that a special envoy from the Indian side had with Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan, where she said that she will not talk about important and critical issues because she was afraid that her room will be bugged. And she said, we can continue having a conversation, but anything critical or crucial, you write on a piece of paper and I will reply to you on a piece of paper. So that was the state of Pakistan at that point of time. But Benazir Bhutto was always hawkish on India. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto before that was hawkish on India. And even now, if you want to see, from where in the ruling Pakistani establishment, the government and the establishment, the nastiest statements on India come, these come from Bilawal Bhutto because the Bhuttos have the same compulsion. There are also some fascinating sidelights in the book. For example, in 1966, when Mr. Lambai's liaison officer to Indira Gandhi, when she makes her stopover on her way back from Washington, stopover in Moscow, she's put up by the Soviet establishment in a very nice villa as they would to all their really special guests. There he says one evening, as he walked Mrs. Gandhi into the villa as a escort officer, a liaison officer, they discovered that in a big ornate tree of ice, there was a bowl of beluga caviar. So Mrs. Gandhi looked at the caviar, smiled happily, and then generally asked a young lama, just a third secretary, uh, if he knew what to do with caviar. And he said he got the chef on duty there to get the accompaniments ready, that is chopped onion, yolk of hard boiled eggs, etc. The usual stuff that is eaten with caviar. And Mrs. Gandhi then decided to sit down to eat. And she said, will you eat with me? And he says, initially I was reluctant. Then I said, yes. So imagine a third secretary in the second year of his service sitting and having caviar with India's prime minister in Moscow. That's one. But there are a couple of other very interesting sidelights from the Bangladesh war period. First of all, see the changes. Again, you have to read the book. See the changes Mrs. Gandhi made in her speech after the Pakistani army surrendered. See how much credit has she given to Bangladeshi Mukti Bayani, Bangladeshi forces, Bangladeshi officials, because she is trying to create this also into a Bangladesh victory. And also she is trying to justify or she is trying to strengthen the claims of Bangladesh being a sovereign country because she wants other countries to recognize Bangladesh also as a free sovereign country. The second thing he says is, and that's a very important point. He says that when she was making her first visit to Bangladesh, that is after Sheikh Mujib has come back, because he was then told to go with other diplomats and open the Indian embassy there. Again, quite a young Indian diplomat, 64 batch. This is late 1971, early 1972 now. So in March, Mrs. Gandhi is supposed to make her first visit to independent Bangladesh when Sheikh Mujibur Rahman will re receive her. Now, Indian army contingents were still there. And while the plan was that the Indian army will withdraw as soon as the job is over, because if the army stays on longer, then it causes complications. And the, wor and the world starts saying that you are an army of occupation, whereas India's idea was to liberate Bangladesh and be done with it. The Indian army, as per the original schedule, was to return on March 25th. March 25th is a very important date in Bangladesh because that is the date when Pakistani army began its crackdown, March 25, 1971. That is when Pakistani army launched what was called Operation Searchlight. So the idea was that within exactly a year of that, on the anniversary of that, Indian army contingents will withdraw. But once Mrs. Gandhi realized that her visit was going to be on March 17, 
she actually insisted that Indian Army contingents finish their withdrawal before she arrived there. So parades that were planned for Indian Army's return on March 25, they were advanced to March 12. So by the time Mrs. Gandhi came there, there was no Indian Army there. And once again, the principle of Bangladeshi sovereignty was established. So that shows very sharp foresight. And the third important insight he tells us about the Bangladesh period is when India was having negotiations with Pakistan in Shimla. Around that time, the question was what to do with prisoners. So there's been a lot of debate about whether India should have released all those prisoners or not, or if some prisoners should have been put to war crimes trials or not. And he says, in fact, he indicates that on the Indian side, there was no total disinclination from doing so. In fact, there might have been some discussion on either holding out to prisoners for longer or or on putting some people on war crimes trial. But he says that by then Bangladesh's mood had changed. While he was posted in Bangladesh, he had figured that Bangladesh's mood had changed and he was sensing that Bangladesh government now was looking at recognition from Islamic countries, also aid from Islamic countries. So they wanted to be softer on this. And remember, the Pakistani forces had surrendered not just to Indian Army or Government of India. Pakistani forces had surrendered to the Joint Command of Mukti Bahini and the Indian Armed Forces. And to that extent, Bangladesh was equally a party to this, if not a bigger party, because it was on their soil, it was to liberate their country and they had a say. And in this case, how the final decision was arrived at on the fate of those prisoners, it is possible that this change in mood in Bangladesh might have had an impact. Now, once again, there will be many disagreements on this. There will be much debate on this, but that is the idea of a good book. That's why it's so important that books like these are published. These are a very valuable addition to our understanding, not just of our past, but of our present. And also, also they inform our future. So please do pick up this book. And as I say that, let me also let me also tell you the bone I have to pick with the publishers, you know. So there's a cliche that I will lean back on. I will tell you, whichever newsroom I run, I actually run a little thing called a cliche watch. So we keep, we keep an eye out for cliches and keep banning them. One of those that are banned is, there's a special place in hell for those who do blah, blah and blah, or those who every morning send you a good morning, may this be a good day for you message on WhatsApp if they have your WhatsApp number and many such. But I will use that line today, that cliche that there is a special place in hell for publishers who publish great books like these. This is a wonderful work of nonfiction, a very important work, a very fine memoir. You publish something like this without an index in my book is a crime in the world of publishing. And that is one thing that's lacking. I'm sure this book will go into more prints. So in the future editions, I'll be very happy if an index is put in and I will then gratefully acknowledge it on Kartak Letter as well.